from casinos to illegal substances, trafficking and killing. The mafia has done it all. And for the most part, men have been at the center of the discussion. But there have been women, female mafia mobsters, who were as iconic as they were notorious. Women who controlled global crime syndicates and had armies of men at their beck and call. In this video, I will show you the most notorious five female mobsters in history. Let's dive in. Virginia Hill, 1916 to 1966. Virginia knew how to keep her mouth shut. Do you ever get any money from any other person whom we might call a gangster other than Siegel? No. Uh, did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. Because she knew what would happen if she didn't. Ani Virginia Hill was born into poverty on the 26th of August, 1916. Ever since she was a little girl, she dreamt of being rich and living the high life. This was nearly impossible for women in the 1930s, unless they were heiresses or, well, pursued illegal businesses. So when Virginia's divorced mother moved to Georgia, she followed her. But soon after, she moved to Chicago, where she would become a waitress and a lady of the night. It wasn't long before she got into the world of crime. By 1933, at the age of 17, she was the mistress to several mob bosses on the East Coast, moving money and messages between Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. When the police tried to get her to turn on the mob, Virginia invoked Omerta, the mafia's code of silence. This earned the mafia's trust, and from there, Virginia continued to climb its ranks. But this wasn't her end goal. She used her mafia ties to enter the high-end Hollywood world. In 1942, Modern Screen wrote about 23-year-old Virginia as she was about to wed actor John Carroll. Yeah, Virginia truly was living the high life, all thanks to her charm, cunning, and countless relationships. But Virginia never married John, and that was a lucky pass for him because by then, she'd already stolen the heart of a notorious yet visionary mafia boss named Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy Siegel was responsible for what Las Vegas is today. But when he met Virginia Hill, he was already running several casinos and a bootlegging empire. Bugsy loved Virginia deeply enough to name his biggest casino after her, but their relationship would be short-lived. On June 20th, 1947, Bugsy was shot and killed inside his and Virginia's Las Vegas home. However, there's a strange twist here. Virginia had traveled to Paris just four days before the shooting. Here's the big catch. Virginia had met Bugsy 10 years before. He was famous for being a hot-tempered loose cannon in the criminal world. So when the Chicago and New York mob learned about Virginia's relationship with him, they instructed her to spy on him for them. Virginia lived between Los Angeles and Bugsy's Las Vegas home, all the while reporting on his earnings. By 1947, Bugsy had become an enemy of the mob, and Virginia knew this. So she flew to Paris knowing her lover would get butchered inside his own home. By 1957, Virginia found herself under national scrutiny when a senator named Estes T. Kefauver launched an investigation into the mafia. But once again, Virginia kept her lips sealed. Well, she did say a few things, only to outrage the bureaucratic world of the law. Knowing she would soon be prosecuted, she escaped to Europe where she lived far from the American press with her son Peter and her husband, Henry Hauser, an Austrian skier. On the 24th of March, 1966, she was found dead from an overdose of sleeping pills with her coat neatly folded beside her and a note that described how tired she was of life. Since her passing, Hollywood has worshipped her. And today, many in the world of crime still look up to the mob queen. Stephanie St. Clair, 1897 to 1969. Life in the mid 20th century was brutal for black women. And yet this woman managed to rise to the top. Not much is known about Stephanie St. Clair's background, except that she was born on Guadalupe Islands on Christmas Eve day, 1897. From the very first years of her childhood, Stephanie St. Clair found that she had a strong will and cared very little about consequences. So on the 22nd of July, 1911, when she was just 13 years old, she hopped on a ship bound for New York City. Soon, Stephanie got into the booming gambling business in Harlem. It was the mid-1920s, and gambling in Harlem was a black man's racket. With her charm, cunning, and exponential intelligence, Stephanie was able to get those same men to work for her. 
they became fiercely loyal to her. At her peak, Stephanie had amassed $500,000. That's eight million in today's money. She became known as the numbers queen, sometimes the policy queen. During the Prohibition era, Stephanie St. Clair was not just a gangster, but a civil rights advocate, fashionista, and businesswoman. She didn't care for suitors either. She wrote to them. But then a notorious white bootlegger named Dutch Schultz, with his ties to the mafia and corrupt politicians, chose to take over Harlem's black gambling business. He issued an ultimatum, sell your business to me or pay royalties. While everyone else panicked, Stephanie St. Clair published her response to his ultimatum in the papers. I'm not afraid of Dutch Schultz or any living man. He'll never touch me. I will kill Schultz if he sets foot on Harlem. He is a rat. Policy game is my game. This led to a full-scale war, but of course, Stephanie knew this, so she struck first. She organized black gamblers to undermine Schultz's association and intimidate white gamblers for working for him. She even took out ads encouraging black Harlemites to patronize only black gambling outfits. Furious Schultz retaliated by issuing threats, murdering her men, and placing a bounty on her head. At one point, he even sent an assassin to take her life, but Stephanie killed the hitman. Eventually, it was the mafia who assassinated Schultz for an unrelated dispute, gunning him down on his toilet in 1935. And Stephanie St. Clair, in her eccentric fashion, sent a telegram to her fallen enemy, signed, Madame Queen of Policy. It read, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. From then on, St. Clair would get into a weird one-year trial marriage with this man, Bishop Amiru al Minin Sufi Abdul Hamid, a questionable anti-Semitic race activist who became known as Black Hitler. She would later terminate her trial period early in January 1938, with three bullets to Hamid's heart after she caught him cheating. But this also meant the end of her freedom. She was sentenced to a decade in prison, and the judge commented, this woman has been living by her wits all her life. After her release, Stephanie St. Clair stepped back from crime and died poor, rags to riches, to rags. Today, she is remembered as a daring female gangster who challenged an era's system and beliefs and encouraged other women to join the criminal world. Griselda Blanco, 1943 to 2012. Griselda Blanco was once known as the Black Widow and the White Powder Godmother. She partook in narcotics-fueled orgies, killed all three of her husbands, and died in a brutal shootout at age 69. She was born in Colombia in 1943. Not much is known about her first years at home, but Griselda was very young when she entered the criminal working world. When she was only 11, she attempted the kidnapping and ransom of a young boy from a rich family. When the family failed to pay, she shot and killed the boy. Griselda was a bad seed with a very hot temper, but the context at home might explain a few things. When she was 19 years old, she ran away from home to escape her mother's boyfriend violating her again. It's not known how many times she was a victim of this monster and just how implicated or ignorant her mother was. But clearly, Griselda grew up in a rough house, so she became even rougher. First, she settled in Medellin. That's right, Pablo Escobar's hometown. So it wasn't long before she became part of the Medellin cartel before Pablo was old enough to make it his own. Soon she would earn more money than any of Escobar's men. During the 1970s, Griselda illegally immigrated to the US and settled in New York. Then she moved to Miami, sensing the surge in white powder consumption in the area. From there, she would oversee the Medellin cartel's notorious coke smuggling. During the 1970s and 80s, white powder was trafficked more than weed and Griselda was at the center of the terrible Miami drug war. For the first time, police officers were being gunned down in the middle of the day, and rival gangs would engage in shootouts in public places, endangering civilian lives on a daily basis. The disregard for human life there at the scene was something that we had never seen or heard of here in South Florida. Griselda was a five-foot-tall mother of four. Seeing her, you really wouldn't peg her for a cruel lord. But she had a thirst for blood, equaled by none. The height of her career, she ordered assassinations left and right, destroying enemy cartels and their claims to the white powder trade. Griselda is responsible for anywhere between 40 and 200 deaths, and some of the victims were her own lovers. Griselda murdered all three husbands too. The first to go 
was a petty forger named Carlos Trujillo after a business dispute. Then she fatally shot her second husband, Alberto Bravo, after she suspected him of cheating on her. Yep, she suspected him. She did not even have proof. And there's always divorce, but Griselda didn't seem to care for this. In 1983, she killed her last husband after he left her, but not before butchering eight strippers who she thought were sleeping with him. And to make matters even worse, she had a German shepherd called Hitler. She was a horrible dictator, and she was proud of it. She even designed her own assassination method, the motorbike drive-by. At her career peak, Griselda was making eight million a month. She had created a special line of lingerie and she hid white powder in the secret sewings that women would wear past the borders. It was a new method and it played on the fact that women were less likely to be randomly checked in airports. She even trained her women smugglers to flirt with the guards and distract them. She encouraged the women to dress very attractively, to be um, flirtatious with customs agents and immigration agents. Griselda's lifestyle was as hectic as it was outrageous. According to The Independent, the Black Widow organized drug-fueled orgies and changed her appearance dramatically almost overnight. If she felt powerful, she would look like the Femme Fatale. If she became paranoid about rival cartels being out to get her, she would groom for days, becoming almost scary looking. On February 17, 1985, she was arrested in her home by the DEA after a costly decade-long operation. The agent in charge was so happy that he kissed Griselda on the cheek. Bob went directly up to Griselda and gave her a big kiss on the cheek. She demanded to know, what is that for? Which Bob replied, that's because I'm so glad to see you. Because Bob had been hunting her for a decade. She was charged with conspiring to manufacture, import, and distribute coke and sentenced to 15 years. The fact that the homicide rate dropped dramatically after she was arrested. By the time of her arrest, Griselda had spread nothing but pain and suffering. And now, it was all coming back to her. Three of her four sons were killed, and her surviving child, Michael, survived seven assassination attempts. In 2004, Griselda was released and deported to Colombia. In 2012, age 69, Griselda was visiting a butcher shop with her pregnant daughter-in-law when two hired assassins jumped off their motorbikes and shot her twice in the head. Her brutal death stands as a symbol of the gruesome reality of cartel lives. Sister Ping, 1949 to 2014. Chen Chui Ping, known as Sister Ping, was born on January 9, 1949, in a poor family village in northern China. By the time she was 15, she began taking care of her family after her father illegally immigrated to the U.S. He stayed there for 13 years before he was apprehended and deported to China in 1977. In China, Ping's father began smuggling people to the U.S. for free, introducing his daughter to a career that would come to define her future. In 1974, Sister Ping moved to Hong Kong, becoming successful, and opened a factory in China. By June 1981, with the help of an elderly couple, Ping successfully applied to be a nanny in New York. Along with her family, she smuggled herself into Chinatown, Manhattan, on the 17th of November, 1981. There, she opened up a shop called Takshun Variety Store, where she appeared to cater to elderly immigrants from her village. In truth, it was a front for her one-woman human smuggling operation, where she moved many of her villagers from China into the U.S. using forged identification documents, commercial airlines, and cargo ships. She became known as the Snakehead Queen. These illegal immigrants were charged $35,000 per head and Chinatown's most violent thugs enforced payment. If the families failed to pay up, they could be beaten, tortured, or violated. Many of these immigrants didn't have that kind of money up front, so in many ways, they would be enslaved to Sister Ping for years after their immigration. Every penny they got had to get to her before it could reach their families. In 1989, Canadian police discovered her racket and arrested her, but she only served four months, and upon her release, she got right back to business. There was a high demand during this period because the U.S. government offered Chinese students present in the United States at the time of the Tiananmen Square protest of 1989 an opportunity to stay. So thousands of illegal immigrants flooded to the country, and Sister Ping was there to lend aid. At a price, of course. On June 6, 1993, a tramp steamer called the Golden Venture 
ran aground off the Rockaway, Queens, with nearly 300 undocumented Fujianese passengers aboard. Ten people perished in the Atlantic, trying to swim from the grounded ship to the beach. Sister Ping was one of the snakeheads behind the voyage, and President Bill Clinton's White House ordered a crackdown on immigrant smuggling. This meant that Sister Ping had to flee the U.S. She thus returned to her home village in China. From a mansion there, she continued to operate her smuggling business. But in 1998, another one of the ships capsized off the coast of Guatemala, killing 14 passengers from China. Needless to say, her name came under the authorities' radar. Originated from the Chinese term She Tou, was popularized in the 80s to describe her underworld status. The legendary smuggling ringleader, affectionately known as Sister Ping, fled after the shipwreck, but was arrested in year 2000. She was arrested in Hong Kong and extradited to the U.S. At the same time of her arrest, the U.S. Department of Justice declared Sister Ping one of the first and ultimately most successful human smugglers of all time. At her peak, she was worth around $40 million. She on the 24th of April, 2014, age 65, Sister Ping passed away in jail from cancer. At her funeral in Manhattan, thousands of mourners flocked the streets, showing you just how influential Sister Ping still was. Many of those who came to the country with her help praised her as their savior and hero. They said she was a modern-day Robin Hood who helped destitute and oppressed Chinese people realize their American dream. Sister Ping's family still owns a Chinese restaurant at 47 East Broadway. Asunta Maresca, from the small town of Capania, the Maresca family had a terrible reputation that stretched across Naples. The head of the family, Alberto Maresca, was a notorious smuggler of contraband cigarettes. His brother Vincenzo had killed his other brother, Gerardo, in cold blood. And the entire family was known as the Lightning Knives because of how good they were with switchblades. This was the family that Asunta was born into, the only girl out of four boys. By the time she was 19, she had a lot of wedding proposals from fellow mobsters. On the 27th of April, 1955, she settled for a Camorra boss known as Pasquale Simonetti, who dealt in smuggled goods. But just three months after her marriage, Pasquale was gunned down in Naples Center Square by a hitman employed by a jealous rival named Camorista Antonio Apacito. Asunta was devastated, six months pregnant, and thirsty for revenge. So she drove to Naples with her younger brother, Cairo, pulled out a revolver, and fired 29 bullets into Antonio, killing him like he killed her husband in cold blood in broad daylight. When asked why she shot him 29 times, Asunta said that she thought she would miss. Her case was taken to trial in April 1959, and it got the attention of the world when she famously declared in the middle of the trial proceeding, I would do it again, the whole courtroom burst into cheers, and men once again began sending marriage proposals while her trial was ongoing. Eventually, she got a 13-year sentence, gave birth to her first child, Pasquale, in prison, and was ultimately pardoned in 1965 after spending 10 years. After this, Asunta returned to the Camorra, got married to another Camorra boss named Humberto Amaturo, her son, who was a teenager at the time, hated Amaturo, and the latter threatened to kill him. In 1974, Pasquale was abducted and killed, and Asunta blamed Amatura for killing her son. The two separated in 1982, and from here on, Asunta devoted all of her energy to the Camorra and her family's business. She took active roles, organized rallies, and publicly defied the boss of a rival Camorra clan after he imposed taxes on her family's business and almost killed her brother Cairo. In 1982, she and her estranged lover Amatura were accused of killing a forensic scientist. Although she denied involvement, she was given a four-year sentence. After her release, Asunta lived in solitude till December 2021, dying a month before her 87th birthday. Ma Barker, 1873 to 1935. Ma Barker raised her four sons into an army of robbers, kidnappers, and killers, and was once named the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of the last decade. Arizona Donnie Clark was born on October 8, 1873 in Ash Grove, Missouri. As far as the FBI knows, her early life was perfectly normal. In other words, ordinary even. According to legend, when Arizona saw the outlaw Jesse James and his gang ride through her town, her desire for adventure and life outside the law was awakened forever. Yeah, outlaws weren't that rare in the 1900s Midwest, but Ma Barker took it to a whole different level. 
1892, Arizona married George E. Barker and began using the first name Kate. Eventually, she would be known as Ma. FBI reports describe George as more or less shiftless. He couldn't really hold a job and the couple lived in poverty. Things got even worse after they had four sons, Herman, Lloyd, Arthur, and Fred. Around 1903, the family moved from Aurora to Webb City, also in Missouri. Then they relocated to Tulsa, Oklahoma. But now, Herman had finished grade school. In his mother's eyes, he was ready for a life of crime. In 1915, Herman was arrested in Joplin, Missouri for highway robbery. Over the next years, all four sons became members of the Central Park Gang. They would kidnap people, rob banks, and even murder people. When her sons would get disciplined or criticized, Ma Barker would say, if the good people of this town don't like my boys, then the good people know what to do. In other words, she knew her sons would get arrested or killed eventually. In August 1927, Herman took his own life to avoid prosecution. He committed robbery and shot a police officer in the mouth. Then came Fred's arrest. And by 1928, the other two brothers were in prison too. The same year, Ma Barker broke up with George and lived in terrible poverty until 1931. This goes to show that her life depended a lot on her son's success. In 1931, Fred was released from prison and brought a friend home with him. Fellow ex-inmate, Old Creepy, real name, Alvin Carpus. Ma Barker provided the headquarters while the two men formed the Barker Carpus Gang. They would rob stores and shoot any officers that would try to stop them. In December 1931, Fred shot the sheriff in the heart. The police then wanted him down even harder. But this chase only led to more crimes, including kidnapping and murder. By 1932, Ma Barker was officially declared an accomplice by the FBI. The same year, Arthur and Lloyd were released from prison and they joined the nasty gang. The five of them moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, a safe haven for wanted criminals at the time. There, they turned from bank robberies to kidnapping under the protection of a very corrupt police officer. The gang got $100,000 in ransom for the abduction of William Hamm and $200,000 after arranging the kidnapping of Edward Brimmer. Imagine what this kind of money meant back in the 1930s. By 1935, the FBI was more determined to catch them than ever, dead or alive. On January 8th, the FBI tracked the family to a Florida cottage. On January 16th, they surrounded the house and ordered them to surrender. From the house, a voice could be heard saying, all right, go ahead. The police thought Ma Barker was going to surrender. Instead, machine gun fire erupted from the house, aiming to kill every officer outside. The shootout lasted four long hours, during which dozens of high school students from a nearby town turned up to watch. By noon, Ma Barker and her son, Fred, were dead. It was cause for celebration for the FBI. Arthur was arrested in Florida and sent to Alcatraz prison. He also died from gunshot wounds after he tried to escape. No one claimed their bodies. Maria Lichardi. 1951. Maria Lechardi was born into crime. Her entire family were staunch members of the Camorra, and her father was a well-known local boss, also known as Guapo. Her older brother, Gennaro Lechardi, formed the infamous Lechardi clan, and when it was time to marry, Maria was wedded off to a Guapo in the Camorra. But a series of unfortunate events happened in her family. First, her brother Gennaro died. Then her other two brothers who took over were arrested. And her husband, who then took leadership of the Lichardi clan, was also arrested by the police. This left the Lichardi clan without a male head. So, Maria took power, becoming the first female camarista to rule the Lichardi clan. She also took leadership over a powerful alliance that her older brother had established among other clans in the Secondigliano district in Naples. Maria was able to settle a lot of unrest in the criminal underworld and shut down the guapos who wanted to take control. Maria also found a way to expand the coalition that her brother created until there were at least 20 clans. She also made them more organized, secretive, sophisticated. However, the biggest change Maria brought to the Camorra was the introduction of prostitution, which her deceased brother had strongly opposed. Under Maria, local, mostly underage girls trying to escape poverty were brought from the Albania Mafia for $2,000 and forced into prostitution by the Camorra. Maria also hooked the girls on drugs and ran a system where these girls, now addicted to the substance, spent all of their money buying Maria's drugs. 
drugs. Throughout much of the late 20th century, no one in the law enforcement agencies knew that Maria Licciardi existed. As a result, through her peak, she never got arrested, charged, or even mentioned by the papers. Meanwhile, the Licciardi clan was seen as a charitable organization in her town, giving out food and money to poor neighborhoods. But all of that changed when a tip led to her first arrest in January 1998. Her lawyers did a great job clearing her name, and she faded into obscurity. Business would go on as usual until a rebellious clan went against Maria's wishes, choosing to sell unrefined heroin to her customers and leading to the deaths of many. As the police cracked down on them, a war broke out that forced Maria to respond with violence. In the aftermath of war, there were 120 casualties in Naples. But even worse, now the world was aware of Maria's existence. Over the three years that followed, Maria avoided arrest, running her clan with an iron fist and assassinating rebellious heads of other clans. On the 14th of June, 2001, Lichardi was arrested by the Naples police and sent to jail for nine years. In prison, she continued running the Lichardi clan. She still does today. The authorities know that she's the only thing standing between the relative peace in the Camorra and the complete mayhem that would unleash in her absence. You can't talk about ruthless female mobsters without talking about Bonnie Parker. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born in 1910 in Rowena, Texas, the second of three children. Her father, Charles, was a bricklayer and he died when Bonnie was four years old. Bonnie's mom continued to work as a seamstress, but it's not hard to imagine that the family lived in constant poverty. So Bonnie started dreaming of fame and riches. As a young teenager, she starred in school plays and pageants, but even then, she really wanted to be the center of attention. Once, a boy upstaged her, so she punched him in the face and cartwheeled across the stage. Just before her 16th birthday, Bonnie married Ron Thornton, her schoolmate. Bonnie and Roy had several run-ins with the law, and Roy was in and out of prison. Roy was also an unfaithful husband, and Bonnie kept a diary, writing down all the ways in which he'd wronged her. After January 1929, they never met again, although both died with each other's wedding rings on. But also, in 1929, Bonnie met Clyde Barrow. Bonnie was 19 and had been working as a waitress in Dallas, Texas, but freshly out of work. She was caring for a friend with a broken arm when Clyde visited the friend's house. It was love at first sight, but not the kind of sweet, innocent love. By age 21, Clyde was already a hardened criminal. He'd been in and out of prison, attempted escape, murdered his sexual aggressor, and chopped off his toes in a sign of protest earning his famous limp. Bonnie just wanted to be famous. And during the Prohibition era, outlaws usually made the headlines. So Bonnie and Clyde became the epitome of the outlaw couple, robbing stores, banks, and engaging in bloody shootouts with the police. In June 1933, the couple was on the run when Clyde crashed the car. Battery acid leaked on Bonnie's leg, eating all the way to the bone. But Bonnie never saw a doctor. She was a hardened criminal too. She wanted to go out with a bang, and it worked. On May 23rd, 1934, a posse that had been hunting Bonnie and Clyde for two days surrounded the car and shot 112 bullets at it. Bonnie and Clyde were dead, but their story still lingers on. They were a young couple, madly in love but unmarried, which was pretty risque and intriguing back in the day, and had a monstrous thirst for blood and money. Bonnie and Clyde became Hollywood superstars, made into several movies and books. Their fame skyrocketed after their death. When the news of their death reached the nearest town, 10,000 people turned up. As the car carrying their bodies was hauled to the morgue, thousands of trophy hunters descended on it, trying to touch the bodies or take some of their possessions. Bonnie's dream to be famous came true, but at a great cost. She died at age 23. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on today's video? What are your favorite female bosses? And did we miss any? Let us know in the comments section. And before you leave, like, and of course, subscribe. See you next time.